Okay. All right, the recording is on. Welcome everyone to the course BC 310 on uh, church and ministry administration. Uh, it's good to have uh, all of you back. Nice to see Afi, Anita, Georgia, Jafina, John Paul, Leah Lima, Lepega, Collins, Roslyn, Sebeshesh, and Zilitoli. Nice to see all of you back in class and thank you for connecting. All right, um, let's uh, pray and get started and then, uh, you know, we'll do the introduction to the course and uh, get into it. Uh, let's just pray together. Father, we thank you that we could come back together as a college, as students, and uh, start a new semester a new year new academic year I thank you for the journey so far and lord we pray that as we journey together in this course um, call that you give us your wisdom give us fill us lord with your understanding and uh, things that we need to learn things that need to be written into our hearts and minds do it lord by the power of your spirit and your word, your truth, let it be established in our hearts and minds. We pray for all those who are in person, online, and will be doing this on the e-learning. Uh, may this course be a blessing to each and every student. And may it help us serve you well and serve your people well. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Thank you, everyone. Uh, let me just go ahead and uh, share uh, the screen and share the notes, then we can get started. Can you all see uh, the PDF that I'm sharing? Coming? Okay. So this PDF is available in the, I've posted it in the uh, coursework, classwork section, so you could take it from there. Um, in the, what are we going to learn in this course on church and ministry administration? One of the things that uh, we need to, uh, I guess, uh, embrace is that uh, we need to combine our depth in the Word of God, the Spirit of God, with good skillful organization and administration so that our churches our ministries can be not only an effective vehicle for the part of god but we can also serve people well and we can preach impact and serve many people so we must understand that we need to combine these two you know combine uh the depth in the word of god and in the spirit uh, with good organization and administration uh, on the other hand uh if you know you know somebody may be very anointed somebody may be very gifted somebody may be very good in you know, in the word and the spirit, but if they don't combine their spiritual gifting with the practical side of uh, proper administration and organization, then their reach and their impact will be limited. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, sometimes they may even struggle, they may even find difficult things difficult in the ministry, not because they don't have the anointing of God or fully gifted and called by God, but because they don't have the proper, you know, call it the support system, you know, the organization, the administration is not there. And so sometimes even things can come to a halt if they don't have that good support system. So uh, what we're going to do in this course uh, is uh, I'm going to just share a lot of what we've been doing here uh, at APC and uh, also you know best practices things that we can learn from others other churches other ministries other organizations on the practical side on the organization and administration side of 
the local church. Uh, the focus the context, of course, is a local church. But if you're doing any other ministry, you know, maybe running a music ministry or a youth ministry or a children's ministry, you can also use many of these things in that context. Uh, these are all transferable ideas. Uh, so they're not, uh, although we are going to be speaking from the context of a local church, uh, these ideas can be used for any ministry. So we'll get uh, some of the things that we're going to cover in this course uh, um, is, uh, you know, we'll start off by talking why is good administration important when we're talking about spiritual ministry, you know, church and Christian ministry. Why do we need good administration? What are some of the objectives that we wish to achieve uh, through good organization and administration? Uh, we'll start off with the formation of a legal entity. That is the church trust and governance. So that's the first step. You need to create a legal entity in order to, you know, uh, legally function in any country. Um, then, you know, how do you give this thing, uh, this legal entity shape and structure, the organization structure? Uh, we will talk about policies, guidelines, and standards. Uh, we'll talk about systems and processes that we put in place. It's almost like setting up the machinery that's needed. Uh, to do things. Uh, we will talk about uh, church staff, uh, human resource management, we'll talk about the culture uh, in the workplace. Uh, we'll talk about the finance side of things, you know, how do you manage the finances? This is very important. Uh, we can't let, we can't go wrong in this area. Uh, some legal aspects, uh, of course, the legal aspects will vary from country to country, but, you know, as an organization, how do you manage that? How do you keep that in check. Uh, then we talk about planning and coordination. So a lot of activities that are happening in the church has to be planned and coordinated. So how do you do that? How do you set up ministry teams to do different ministries in the church? Uh, how do you set up volunteer teams? Uh, um, you know, uh, a lot of things, uh, especially in a church or a Christian ministry, uh, there are a lot of volunteers involved. Uh, people are contributing their time, their energy, their effort. So how do you be, you know, how do you take care of volunteers? Uh, the church culture, a little bit on project management, how do you execute projects? How can you leverage technology? And how do you pursue excellence? So this, these are kind of things we're going to cover. Uh, it's a wide, wide, you know, area, a lot of things. Uh, but hopefully, you know, we will give you, share with you, you know, the key things, key points or key thoughts here in each of these areas that you can use to build upon. Uh, next semester, we'll have a separate course on media and technology in ministry, where we kind of get into a greater detail on uh, leveraging technology, get into the details of media and technology, how you can use that. Uh, so uh, this in, in this course, I'll just introduce you to the ideas, uh, different, different things that can be done and what are you doing. I'll give a quick overview, but in our next semester, we'll, in that course on media and technology, you're going to get a little bit more deeper into how you can use media and technology in ministry. Right. Um, so we'll have uh, uh, one uh, one assessment. I think I'll put it at the end of the course. Uh, it'll be uh, three parts uh, covering three sections of this entire course. They'll be pretty, pretty simple, straightforward, open book, open notes. And nothing complicated, just to give you a good review of the course. All right. Um, yeah, so we're going to get started. Uh, let me pause. Are there any questions about the course, about what we're going to cover? Anybody has any questions? All right. No questions? Let's get started. Let's get into the course. And. Uh, so in lesson one, I'm sharing the PDF, back to uh, the PDF. Lesson one, what is the importance of good administration, uh, especially from a church or a Christian ministry perspective? Because sometimes people can say, hey, this is God's work. He doesn't need us. He doesn't need us putting our brains and organizing and planning. It will just happen. You know, give the Holy Spirit free flow. Uh, don't interfere, et cetera, et cetera. So there are a lot of, you know, 
um, things that people can say which uh, are actually against the idea of organization and administration. So, uh, you know, how do we kind of bring these two perspectives together and get a biblical understanding of this? So I want us to think about some things here from the scriptures. First of all, in the Bible, we see that God himself is a God of order, design, organization, and creativity, right? So even in the things that God does, and right from chapter one in Genesis, uh, God didn't just say, hey, just everything come, you know? You know, you can think about it. God is doing it. You know, Genesis 1 says, on the first day, he did this. Second day, he did this. Third day, he did this. Fourth day. He just didn't say, hey, everything just come. You know, he could have. He didn't have to do it over six days. He didn't have to, you know, be organized in that sense. Do certain things on day one and day two. and day. So there itself, we are seeing in Genesis chapter 1, that for whatever reason, God is doing things in a very organized way. In, you could even say, in a very planned way. He planned, day one, this will happen. I'll do this. Day two, I'll do this. Day three, I'll do this. Day four. So he planned. And then day seven, God rested. It's not like he needed to rest. Oh, I have spent so much energy, I'm tired. <laughs> no. It was very intentional. It was something he designed, right? So we can therefore, you know, we can, it is safe to say that, um, you know, that our God is a God of order, design, uh, and he's of course creator. He's, there's creativity in all that he's doing, but he's also very organized, planning his work. Uh, we can look at some scriptures uh, you know, when, when we come to First Corinthians 14. It's a well-known chapter there, First Corinthians 14, where Paul is addressing having order in the church, and he kind of sums up all his instruction uh, in, in First Corinthians 14, and the last verse, verse but not last, uh, verse, verse 33. Uh, we can look at verse 33 and also verse 40. First Corinthians 14, 33 and 40. He says in verse 33. Uh, Jeffy, now you want to read verses 33 and verse 40, please. Oh, you don't have the mic. Okay. Never mind. I'll just read it. It's okay. I'll read it. Um, God is not the author of confusion, but of peace, as in all the churches of the saints. And then verse 40, he says, about what happens in the church, he says, let all things be done decently and in order. So, God is not the author of confusion. He doesn't want this chaos in, in that sense of things happening randomly, arbitrarily, without, you know, order. But instead, God is the God of order. Let all things be done decently and in order. So while there's creativity and while God is powerful and God is omnipotent, and he's still very orderly in the way he does things. It is true, he's omnipotent. I mean, he's all-powerful. Nothing is containing his power, but he's still doing it intentionally in a very orderly way, very planned way, uh, decently and in order. Now, there are many other examples we can look in the uh, Old Testament. I'll just mention uh, a few. Uh, when we see how God, and you read about this in the book of Numbers, as, you know, and we can read the first 10 chapters in the book of Numbers. Um, God, as he's leading the people out of Egypt to the land of Canaan, uh, once they come out of Egypt, they cross the Red Sea. After that, God is saying, okay, Moses, I want you to organize the people. So he had given instruction to Moses to build the tabernacle. And then he tells them, I want three tribes to be on one side of the tabernacle. Then these other three tribes should be pitched on this side of the tabernacle. Another three tribes on the south side. 
another three tribes, three tribes on the west side. You know? So it's not like, okay, all of you just stay where you are, put your tent where you are, just stay where. No, it's very organized. You know, these three tribes on the north, these three on the east, these three on the south, these three on the west. Then when all of you have to make your journey, you blow the trumpet, then these three tribes start moving. Then these follow, and these follow. So you can just look at that, and, and all these details are there in the book of Numbers. It may seem very boring to read, you know, the first 10 chapters. God is giving all these instructions, like be like this, be organized like this, you get up like this, you go like this. So it seems very boring to read, but it's telling us so much about God. It's telling us that God, he wants them to move in a very organized way. And he's giving detailed instructions. You blow the trumpet, they lift up their flag, and the people follow the flag. And they follow that. So he wants things to be done in a very orderly way. Right? So we see that uh, as, a, as, a, as a beautiful example, where God is a God of order and organization and so on. So similarly, when we see God uh, uh, wanting Moses to build the tabernacle. He says, Moses, this is how the tabernacle must be built. You know, he just didn't say, okay, make anything you want. No, this is how it is. Solomon, when you are going to build the temple, God gave the design to David. And he says, this is how the temple must be built. Right? So uh, you can see, uh, you know, God just giving details on how things have to be organized, how things have to be done. Uh, other examples in the Old Testament, uh, Moses leading his team. Uh, you know, uh, yeah, we see how uh, Moses, at one point, he was trying to take care of all the people. And then Jethro, his father-in-law, comes, Exodus 18, says, Moses, see, if you're going to do this all by yourself, it's going to be very difficult. But... What I want you to do, and Jethro gives Moses the advice. It says, you know, you appoint leaders. Yeah. And you organize them to take care of groups of 50, groups of hundreds. So they will help you this, you know, take care of the people. Rather than you sitting and trying to take care of all of these people, you have leaders under you who will be in charge of groups of 50 and groups of 100, and they will be able to take care. So you see that. Then in Numbers, later on, in Numbers 11, God himself says, Moses, I want you to select 70 elders. And I will put my spirit on these 70 elders. And these 70 elders will help you take care of the people. Right? So Jethro has given advice in Exodus 18. God himself says, Moses, you appoint 70 elders to take care of all of these people. And uh, order in the camps, number number chapter 10 is what I just uh, referred to about their journey. Um, worship in the tabernacle. Again, this is very, very amazing when we think about this. Uh, worship in the tabernacle. You know, think about David, how he org organized worship in the tabernacle. Uh, this is something that went on for 33 years, nonstop. So there was worship happening in the tabernacle of David nonstop for 33 years, day and night. How was that possible? Uh, you read about how David organized it. You know, uh, David said, okay, we'll have uh, 24 teams. You know, everybody's given one hour slot. And you come, you lead worship, do the prayer, go. So he had about, um, you know, dedicated worship leaders. Then he had about 4,000 people, uh, musicians and others. Then he had another, you know, 4,000 people serving in the temple. So almost a, a group of more than 8,000 plus people was serving in the tabernacle. But they're all very well organized. You know, the worship leaders are given, the worship teams, and we will call the worship teams, uh, they're all given their slots to come in, and they all continuously are leading worship and the musicians with them. And so there was non-stop praise and worship going on for 
33 years from the time he built the tabernacle um, I mean, until later on it, 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 it kind of phased out. But this this happened. So even in the worship of the tabernacle, we see such such detailed planning and organization. It just did happen randomly. You know, was God in it? Yeah, God was in it. Was God being worshipped? Yes. Was God being glorified? Yes. But there was also organization. There was planning. There was order, and it was very detailed. Um, other examples we can see in the rebuilding of the walls in the book of Nehemiah. You know, God stirred up Nehemiah to go in and rebuild the walls, but it did. It just didn't happen randomly. You know, Nehemiah went, and he, all the people who were uh, willing to come and help him. You know, he. Uh, kind of making a lot of noise here. Anyway, uh, he organized the people. You know, to um, uh, uh, to work in different along the different gates of the wall, uh, gates of the city wall. They organized them, and they were all given their tasks to be done. So, even in the rebuilding of the walls, Nehemiah carried it out in a very systematic and a very organized way. Right? So we see these examples. Of course, it was God who was at work. It was God who had stirred up Nehemiah. It was God who had given him favor. It is God who had stirred up the hearts of the people uh, to participate in the rebuilding of the walls, but Nehemiah did it in a very organized way, and the work was done. We come into the New Testament. Again, in the New Testament, we see uh, you know, uh, organization being done. Uh, so, uh, uh, early example that we see early on is in Acts chapter 6, where uh, uh, in, the, in the church, when they were in the early church, when they were having to distribute food to the people, you know, so there were the Hebrews and the Greeks. They were Jewish. They were believers, uh, Jewish believers. Some of them who were Hebrews, uh, some of them who were from Greek, who were believe uh, would become believers. They were all part of the church, and the Greek speaking and the Hebrew speaking Jews who had become believers. And uh, they were serving food to all the people. But there were some problems because the Hebrews and the Greeks, they felt that you know they were not being treated equally, the Hebrew-speaking Jews and the Greek-speaking Jews. So there was a little problem. And uh, what did the apostles do? By the help of the Holy Spirit. This was their solution. They said, let's appoint seven men. We will put seven men in charge of this matter and let these men serve food to the people and you know help take care of this whole thing of serving food. So you can imagine, you know, you have to serve 3,000 people food every day. It's not an easy thing. But what did they do? They delegated that responsibility. You know, the apostles didn't go, maybe in the first you know period, first early. Yeah, you know, early weeks, maybe all the apostles were busy serving food. And then they realized, look, this is not something we can do. And, uh, you know, people are also complaining that then they're, they're not getting the right, or whatever the issues were, they're not being treated fairly or whatever. So they said, okay, it's of us trying to solve it. Let's give this responsibility to seven men. So they formed a team. We would call it today our ministry team, <laughs> or the ministry team in charge of the ministry of food something like that and that team you handle the whole thing right of course they chose godly people they chose seven men full of wisdom full of the holy spirit who had a good report that means they chose the right people but they gave that responsibility to the seven people and said you take care of this whole thing there are all these thousands of people who need to be given food every day you it's your responsibility we are not going to worry about it right and then from then on it's see in acts chapter uh, six, we read that things worked out fine after that, and the word of God increased, and you know the church kept growing. So, the very beginning of the church itself, early church, the Holy Spirit is moving. God is at work, but slowly, things are being organized. You know, work is being delegated. Now, when we come to Later on, 
So when we come to First Timothy, the third chapter, which is, you know, uh, we are almost, we're talking almost about uh, AD 60. So almost th into 30, 40 years, 40 years after the beginning of the early church, when Paul is writing in the First Timothy chapter 3, around AD 60, uh, just before he died, so it'll be around AD 67 or 68, when Paul is writing, by this time, it is very clear. He's writing about spiritual leaders and he's writing about deacons. Right? So that means by this time, in the minds of the leaders of the church, it is very clear that there are people who will be put in charge of spiritual responsibility, like what we would call them as pastors and you know people who are doing spiritual ministry. And then there are also people who are considered as deacons. That means they are given administrative responsibility. They're given responsibility for the organization of the church. So that becomes very clear in Paul's writing in 1 Timothy 3. That means, you know, uh, uh, in the first 40 years, people have understood that in the church, you need both kinds of ministries. You need people who are going to do the spiritual ministry. Or you need people who are going to do the helps of the administrations and the organization ministry. And both of these require godly people. So when in First Timothy chapter 3, Paul is saying, you choose spiritual leaders like this. And then he says, you choose deacons like this. But even the deacons, it is he's talking about, you know, godly character, godly things. Like they should be people of good report. They should love the Lord. They should... So both sides, whether they are doing organization side or spiritual side, you need godly people in the church for the uh, serving service of the people. And in Romans 16, and we will look at these uh, scriptures, we, will, uh, we see Paul writing about, uh, 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 you know, Phoebe, I think, yeah, Phoebe, who, who, who's a woman, but she's in charge of the administration of the church. She's handling some administrative matters in the church. So uh, we see even women involved in this thing. So uh, it, it becomes very clear, both from the Old Testament and the New Testament, that God is organizing his work. He's God, he's powerful, but when he's working on the earth through people, he's working in a very, very systematic, very organized way. Right? And when we come to the local church, and we're going to uh, read some of these scriptures here, uh, in the local church, we see that there are gifts and ministries in the church that are specialized in what we would refer to as organization. So let's go to Romans 12 first. Romans 12, 4 through 8. Um, we'll read that. Romans 12. 4 through 8. Somebody could read it online. Romans 12, verse 4 to 8. Okay, yeah, right. Okay. 4 to 18. Yeah, yeah, Romans 12. Romans chapter 12, verse 4 to 8. For us, we have many members in one body, and all members have not the same office. So we being many are one body in Christ. And every one members one another, having them gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, that is prophecy, that is prophecy according to the proportion of faith, or ministry, that is made of our ministry, or he that has teaching and teaching, or he that is exalted or exalted, he that gives as a blood specificity, he that rules with divisions, he that shows mercy with cheerfulness. Okay, thank you. So, in this list of what we we call as um, believers' functions or believers' ministries, um, of course, this is not a complete list. It's not like everything that is there, but just a representative list of different uh, gifts and functions, graces that God gives to His people. We find certain gifts which we would connect to organization or administration. For example, verse seven, or ministry. 
that word ministry simply means any kind of service. So it, it's not just the preaching and the teaching of the word, but any kind of serving is here. That's verse number seven. So do it, you know, do it to serve people. Then there is giving in verse number eight. He who gives, so giving. So God may equip people to be very generous. You can give with, you can give your money, you can give your time, you can give, you know, anything else. So giving, generosity. Then you also see leadership. He who leads with diligence. So leadership is another gifting that God has placed in the church, leadership. So this could be leadership in anything. Somebody could be leading a ministry team. Some, somebody could be leading uh, a team of volunteers. Somebody could be leading, you know, a uh, certain aspect of the thing that's going on in the church, leadership. You know, leadership can be in so many areas. But you see that God has given people the ability to be able to lead others. So leadership is given, and it can be used in so many different contexts, leadership. So whoever leads, let them do it with diligence. Then he says, showing mercy, do it with cheerfulness. So you see, ministry, giving, leadership. They're not necessarily, all these three are not necessarily the preaching or the teaching of the word. But it is some, it's very easy to re recognize these in the context of organization and administration that somebody could be serving, leading, or giving, you know, in the context of this. So God has put these in the church. Let's also look at 1 Corinthians chapter 12, and we will read verse 28. 1 Corinthians 12 and verse 28, please. Somebody could read that. Anyone? And God has appointed these in the church, first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, after that miracles, then gifts of healings, helps, administrations, varieties of tongues. Mm, thank you. So notice what he says in verse 3. God has appointed these. That means these are, you know, gift functions. Yeah, they're kind of related to the functions. He's put them in the church in the church and in this list you, you know of course he talks about apostles and prophets and teachers and all of that but then you come down along in the gifts you see in the list you see helps administration helps it means anybody doing anything to help it's a gift god has put in the church just like how he has put apostles, the prophets, the teachers, the pastors, whatever. He's put these people in the church. And what are they gifted at? They're gifted at helping. They're gifted at, you know, doing things. And what, you know, we would use, yeah, and I notice the next word, administrations. That means they are good at organizing, planning, um, running the, you know, the ministry, how things should work, how things should function. So the apostle himself is not an administrator. The apostle is a gift that God has placed in church. Pastor, teacher, evangelist, all of that. God has placed him. But he's also placed people who are specially gifted by God in helps, in administrations, that's in the organization of the church. Right? So what must we do? We must recognize these people and we must... Uh, Obviously, God has put them in the church because he wants the church to do well in these areas, just as he has put, you know, all the other gifts in the church. So obviously, he wants the church to do well in administration. He wants the church to do well in the organization and the functioning part. That's why he's put these people. And so we must recognize these people. Uh, we must give them the space and the opportunity to come and do what God has gifted them to do. And that the helps in the administrations working alongside these spiritual ministries, you know, apostle, prophet, pastor, teacher, all that. They're all working side by side, and then you'll have a healthy.
church. You'll have a church that's functioning very well. Right? So God has put this, and we must recognize it, and therefore we must provide the, uh, the support system for these people to function and do their work. Right? And then lastly, when you look at this, uh, uh, you know what, what Paul himself has uh, written to the local church. So he writes to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, uh, verse 34, 1 Corinthians uh, 11. You know, he say this is in the context, of course, of these people coming in. Having the Lord's table together, he says, if anyone is hungry, let him eat at home, lest you come together for judgment. And the rest I will set in order when I come. Notice he says, I will set things in order. Okay. That means the local church has to function in an orderly way. You know, even in the matter of giving communion, it's got to, there's got to be an order. It's not like chaos. Like everybody come take your cup of juice and take your cup of piece of bread and you know go. No, no, no. This this order. I will set in order things in the local church. Uh, we read First Corinthians 14, 14, where Paul wrote, you know. God is not the, uh, let all things be done decently in an order. Even to Titus, he writes about keeping things in order in the local church. Titus chapter 1 and verse 5, he says, he tells Titus, for this reason I left you in Crete, that you should set in order the things that are lacking and appoint elders in every city as I commanded you. So elders, Typically, typically given for spiritual ministry, set in order the the functioning part that should go well in all the cities where he had churches. So you know, just this uh, uh, when we look at God and, and and the way God works, both in the Old Testament and in the New Testament, there is organization, there is administration, there is order. Right. So let me just. Uh, just cover a few more thoughts and then you know we'll keep some time for questions as well and discussion. So when you think about from a practical perspective, um, also there's a need, um, uh, or perhaps we could even say there's a demand or maybe even an expectation for efficiency. You know, people in the congregation ex expect the local church to be organized and efficient, especially in an urban context. Right? So you're in a city, and if you're in a, in a, in a metro like Bangalore, there, you know, people are expecting the church to be very organized. If we say uh, our event, whatever, whether it's a Sunday service or whether it's something that starts at uh, 10 o'clock or service starts at 10.30, they're expecting it to start at 10.30, you know? And they're expecting everything to be okay. You know, that means light should be there, fan should be there, you know, the the things should be properly functioning uh, we, because that's kind of what they used to in the city right they most of them are working in corporate offices things happen on time things happen efficiently so by default they expect the local church to also function in a, a same way right um, and uh, uh, they expect for instance if somebody wants a letter from the church they expect to get it within one or two days. You know, uh, somebody wants uh, you know some assistance from the church. They expect things to happen quickly. Right? So there is that expectation today, especially in an urban context, for the church to be efficient, uh, the church to respond quickly, and uh, uh, the only way that can happen is if the church is organized and it's you know it's functioning well. Uh, another important practical aspect is that people actually want to serve in the church. They don't want to remain spectators. They want to serve, but they are bringing skills that they have. And the skills they have may not be necessarily in the preaching and the teaching. You know, many of them have very good skills in organization, planning, um, uh, in administration, and on those kinds of things. And they want those skills to be used, you know, for the for the to serve in the church. So we can't say, "Ha, oh, you don't preach, you don't teach, so you can't serve in the church." No. You know, what are the skills you have? Yeah, you're you're a good leader. Uh, you're a good organizer. You're a good good in planning. 
you're good in you know managing money you're good in uh, technology you're good in media you're good in some of these, these these things okay see how that can be used in the church right so we need to create those kinds of opportunities and lastly uh, a third reason a practical thing is that uh, the world around us um, they are also both you know both believers and even those that are outside they are expecting such competencies from the church for the church to be relevant you know for example if, if you say look at do you have a website you know they, they're expecting you, know, you for the church to have a website and on the website you're going to announce your events and all that they, they're not expecting the church to be sending letters every day you know this is event that no you have a website can you send me an email can you send you a whatsapp you know a, a message a text message um do you have a you know can i connect with you online uh, things like that so people are expecting the church to be ministry in these ways even today right to be relevant and so on so uh the congregation is expecting the church congregation wants to serve in the church using their skills and even the world outside is expecting these kinds of competencies from the church and so uh, the church needs to have good administration and uh, uh, organization right so let me pause here to see if there are any questions before i go forward in the uh, next section any questions here so far Jeffy, now you have a question? Go ahead. Oh. Yeah, so I just want to ask you uh, how sometimes it feels like too much, like being having a great vision and then thinking about administration, people creates a little fear or scared. <laughs> Uh, because the, the starting days, you don't even have the enough people, uh, or you don't even know how you're going to start things sometimes as God gives you the vision. I just want to ask you, like, uh, what's the first thing you did as you started your ministry? Or uh, what are the things or struggles for you to think of? Uh, I think we all want to have some ministries. We all want to have some people, some help. But uh, how to overcome the fear of starting something sometimes uh, like when i think of myself i feel like can i really do this uh, these many people the ministries do i have those abilities or <laughs> not these are some questions that i have and i also wonder like will it really happen or not so i just want to ask like what's the first thing that you struggled with and how you overcame it in, in the case of administration okay this yeah yeah that's good good thing so so the question you know how how can you uh, i mean when i when i think about the uh, uh, the question itself like i, I think one is uh, preparation right so uh try to you know try to uh, prepare as as well as you can for the launch and the starting of the ministry God has given you. So try to think about, you know, try to develop as whatever skills you can uh, on the administrative side as well, the organization side as well. You know, uh, try to think about it, try to learn as much as you can. Uh, try to, so, uh, you know, before uh, we started All People's Church, um, I also, spent one of the things he did was i also spent time looking at how other churches are running you know so i i took the time so, okay how is that church organized how is that church organized just looking at different uh, not that we're trying to copy but we're trying to learn the good things you know so i tried to say okay how is the church organized so i looked at uh, especially one or two good models of churches you know i said oh yeah this church is very they're doing things like whatever that was very mission focused church they're doing a lot of missionary work and so that was something you know I, I wanted apc to be i wanted apc to be a missions oriented church that means we're not just there to feed people and keep here ourselves but 
I wanted us, I wanted the church to be something that's looking outwards, that is uh, reaching across the city, the nation, and the nations. So uh, I, I try to look at other churches that are doing that and observing them. Like, how are they doing it? How are they organized? What are the different departments they have? How is that? You know, of course, I couldn't get into meaning. I was only looking at it from an outsider, like from a distance. Um, just trying to learn, you know. So that, that I found very useful as a part of preparation to start APC. Right? And then, yeah, when we started, um, in the early years, at least the first two years, I had to do everything. Like, so I would, for example, in the, in the, you know, in the first two years, okay, I would come and I would set up everything. Of course, I had, you know, Amy was helping me, my wife, and then uh, there was one other couple. But I would come, I would set up the whole sound equipment. But our sound equipment wasn't much. It was two big speakers, three mics, and one amplifier. So I set up everything, you know, come, set it all up, arrange all the chairs, clean the chairs, arrange the table. So basically, you are doing everything, right? Start to finish. And set up the projector, everything, prepare. And of course, you have to prepare the slides that you're going to for the songs, prepare the sermon, arrange the book table, everything you do before the service comes. Then you'll have, you know, 10, 20 people come and worship, you know, collect the offering. Then after everybody goes, you have to count the offering, write it in the accounts book, uh, everything, you have, pack, you have to pack up, then put everything away. So the first two years was like that, you know, where uh, I had to do everything, but I wanted I had to do it. Nobody else was there. Uh, and But I wanted to do it in a very organized way. So whatever I knew, right, I I applied it. I, you know, I would write the accounts in, the, in a book, keep record, everything. So we have, you know, the very first book that was used. You know, this is the offering that came. It was written day one, day 10. This is the amount that came. So from the very beginning, you know, everything uh, was kept organized. But it was small, you know, like you say, you can have a congregation just less than 20 people. There is work to be done. You still have to set up the sound and the mics and all that. Uh, but we try to do it in as good way as possible. Right? Then slowly, as more people came, you could delegate. Hey, can you help me do the setup? You know, OK, somebody help. Hey, can you help me pack up? Yeah, somebody help pack up, you know. So like that, it got started, you know, and then slowly, you, you, you build from there. So those were the early days. And that's how, you know, initially you might have to do everything, getting things organized. Uh, but then as people join, uh, you can get more people to help you. And they will also catch the vision. OK, let's pause here. Uh, we'll take a break, 10-minute break. We'll come back and we'll continue this. Right? Thank you. <laughs>